Agent Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here. Try to make some uh, quick and pointy remarks following up on my colleagues. And I start my timer right now. Um, let me get if I get this right. OK. I'll take, uh, I'll take I think Peter uh, put a challenge to us that was, was very important. How do we shape the future by challenging the present? And I think that's part of the message that I want to give here. And also following up on Pushpan's point that we need to look under the macroeconomic trends to really understand the underlying base of, of what we are dealing with. And I like to start with this graph. I mean, to understand and to appreciate the time that we are living on. We live in a time of accelerated changes. And you can see it from many angles. But I think the angle that I think we have to look at is that we have done a lot. And we have accomplished a lot in a short period of time to cope with changes that are at a scale uh, that are very unprecedented. Uh, at the same time, uh, this, this particular situation creates, creates a dilemma that we're still learning how to focus. Accelerated change, meaning accelerated responses, but it also means that we have emergent features, emergent properties, emergent conditions all the time. And that requires us that we critically look at what we have done and what we have accomplished to be able to see what are the limitations that we have to move forward. And that's part of the intention that I want to, my point here is to take a positive look of how much we have accomplished in recognizing the value of force, recognizing the value of, of communities, recognizing the value of ecosystem service, but how much some of all the structural problems continue to persist. And it's very important that we look into that dynamic to understand why so many initiatives that we have as individuals, as municipalities, as countries, do not add up to a global level. Uh, I took the title of evolutionary governance from uh, my, my colleague and friend, Lynn Ostrom, when in a similar week, a couple of years ago, she talked about the, the need to look at governance in a diverse perspective, looking at many mechanisms at different levels that are taking the charge and doing and, 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 and pursuing solutions to the problems that we're facing, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a single global solution. But at the same time, that challenge uh, is limited by a number of persistent issues that we need to confront. The same acceleration we see in the Amazon, and I'll enter again through the Amazonian eyes, in part because I work in the field and I think we need to look under the macro indicators to really understand what's taking place. And some of my key points here, you know, already recognizing how much advance we have made in all those fronts, uh, have to do with the mismatches that we have to confront today. And I'll point to three particular mismatches that I think are important challenges for us as scientists. I think we're a long way in terms of having the tools and the skills to confront the kind of complexity that is emerging. Uh, but also for us as a society, whether to re how do we evaluate and how do we recraft policies in a continuous way to deal with a, a world that is con continue in an intense process of transformation. So we have done a lot, but we face now a huge dilemma of an interconnected systems. The same advances we have made that have been able to deal well with governance at a one particular level are now subsumed by, by changes happening around those areas. And we need to see, and I think many of the messages before are pointing to the same direction uh, in terms of how connectivity, how do we think about governance in an interconnected world and continuously rethink the events that we make and adapt the institutions that we have. The first one, and was touched many times, and I think C4, in fact, is leading uh, our intellectual uh, exercise on thinking about landscapes. It's the mismatch of land governance institutions. We have come a long way to recognize the right of indigenous peoples to, to, to put aside reserves, to develop conser conservation areas. This has been perhaps the most successful effort in the last 20 years, if you think in the context of the CBD. This is true throughout the world. As far as 
limiting the expansion of deforestation, it has been very successful. As far as providing rights for uh, indigenous and local communities, it has been extremely successful. But as far as uh, responding to a world where connectivity, and we'll use the term of, of Orin Young, functional interdependence connects resource systems, agricultural systems, forest systems that are apart, but integrated through watersheds and other process, we have now to rethink our strategies of conservation to face that. And I could talk a lot about what it means in terms of, of governance, in terms of land regime policies, but the clear message is that we need to think in terms of landscape level. We need to think beyond conservation areas or protected areas as a strategy for conservation. Many of the sustainable development goals, for instance, tend to focus on protected areas and protected species, when most of the challenge that we face is conservation outside of protected areas. Uh, the landscape in the Amazon is telling of that. Well, what I'm, selling, what I'm telling as an unwanted hug is the reality of a large number of indigenous, indigenous areas, conservation areas, and many other areas that are being very fast surrounded by intensive agricultural systems. The problem, as I said, in the Shingu case, I think is the, is the best example at the center a conservation system, in this case, a governance system that, that represents an indigenous movement has been sufficient to resguard the boundaries of the park in an area of active agroindustrial transformation. At that level, that governance system has been very successful. But it has not been enough to deal with the pressures that come through the watershed, the pollutions, the fires, the, 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 the impacts that are part and ever more part of a system that is interconnected. So there's a need to rethink how we think conservation, how we look at landscape, how we look at ecosystem service connecting this area, and move to a next step of this model that has been successful so far, but is limiting to deal with the world in which we're living, particularly with the challenge of climate change. And Carlos shows some examples of how that is affecting the Amazon and how this kind of governance can be successful at one level, but is limited to deal with that. I just put this slide as there are many bottom-up initiatives. And again, as in many other fronts, we see bottom-up initiatives coming up and people trying to take a lead on that. That's one part of the problem, or solving the problem. But it needs, we need to streamline policies and ways in which we talk across different groups, we talk across agriculture and forest systems, and we, we reconsider how to connect and how to deal with connectivity and to think about ecosystem service more broadly. The second mismatch, and that was mentioned by, by Carlos before, is the mismatch of value aggregation. Again, we came a long way in recognizing the value of ecosystem service, recognizing the value of indigenous knowledge, and a number of other things. But we haven't changed a bit the political economy of extractivism in the global political economy of extractivism. We have complemented the political economy of extractivism with economies of subsidies. And many of these areas, and many, much of the economy in these areas live on subsidies. And we need to confront the reality in which the people that are largely responsible for reducing deforestation and reducing carbon emissions, as we have seen, as Carlos has illustrated, they themselves live on, on subsidies and have not been able to enter into the market and to enter into, into an economy and a productive economy. Much of these areas are running or changing from productive to unproductive economy. And that's a serious, a serious issue that we need to confront up front. Um, I've been studying one of those systems that I think illustrate the potential outside of conservation areas for small farmers, largely uncapitalized, to respond to market opportunities, to use their local knowledge, and to lead the way in terms of intensification and, and transformation of areas to respond to market, but in a way that uh, offers enormous economic potential. The acai fruit cases is one of the examples of that. Nowadays, the system that produces throughout the Amazon uh, and all over the world. 
the returns are very different. And I think that touches very much on the key transformation that we need to rethink. And rethink the idea of an extractivist economy for the forest regions of the world, particularly the tropical forest regions of the world. Value is aggregated elsewhere. There are significant economic benefits of an economy like Acai has brought to the local populations. I'm away from, from not saying that. But more and more, it, it is the smallest share of a billionaire, a billion dollar, two billion dollar economy that rests with the population that produce and rests in the municipalities that need most the income to overcome the, under the development needs that they have. Uh, we need to start to, ch to change. We need, to, we need a vision of a different economic alternative and a transformative economy for, for, for uh, forest areas. That's very clear when you look at, under those macroeconomic indicators, this is one of the examples I have worked and I have students worked in many other areas of the Amazon and the picture is the same. Even in areas where you have production, you have an active market, you have a valuable resource, most of the people are depending on government transfers or different kinds of subsidies as their main source of income. That's one aspect of it that, that tells a lot about, about the vulnerability of, of these kinds of economy. But there's another side of it, which are the municipalities in which uh, these resources are. They do not capture the rich economy that resources, that of resources. Acai is an example of that. The municipalities that produce Acai, again, a $2 billion economy, do not capture a cent of that economy through tributary or other forms of value aggregation. There's a side to it because the most, the biggest demand in these areas is urban infrastructure. Urban infrastructure is the key element for a lot of the population to cope with climate change issues, to cope with all sorts of other vulnerability issues. There's municipalities are always in depth to cope with the pressure of, of, uh, of an increasing as fast as accelerated urban expansion. Um, the third point that I want to make, my timer just clicked at 12 minutes, so I'm almost there. The, two, the, the, the last point that I want to make is a mismatch of expectations. And I think I want to call attention to that because on the one hand, you have to recognize the way that indigenous peoples have gained voice internationally, uh, the way we, we appreciate that. But it's also important to recognize that there is a tendency, and a lot of the time, to romanticize the stewardship that indigenous people have in, in conserving force and reducing car, uh, uh, carbon emission for climate change. Very often, and perhaps uh, too often, uh, this discussion where indigenous populations come to play is to show a contrast between a material and an intangible value of nature, which is far, very far from the reality and from the lives of most indigenous peoples. But we are very much, I think, moving in some ways to a dichotomy where we try to see as those two values as incompatible. And with that, I think we avoid having a discussion about poverty, about the economic conditions in which many of the indigenous communities and many of the local communities that have taken the burden of reducing carbon emission largely in the last 20 years uh, live. Um, I'll leave with, well, those are some of the indicators coming from research in many places that show that disconnection and that we need to pay attention to, to, the, to the economies of conservation that we have put in place and think about a new phase in which I think Carlos uh, touched on some of those key issues that we need to invest in human capital in these areas. We need to invest in infrastructure in these areas. There's a long history of external investment and efforts to increase social capital. Social capital is very difficult to do externally. As long as subsidies go away, as long as projects go away, those ideas go away. We really need to give concrete and very concrete uh, uh, improvements to the population that have become such an important player in, in, in climate change and also paradoxically at the end where they become the most vulnerable. Thank you.